So, it's good to be with you here tonight. A uh, couple of things. Uh, this week was Rosie's birthday. Happy birthday, Rosie. Yes. This last Friday night, I failed to bring it to everyone's attention, was their 60th wedding anniversary. Yes. And so, Lyle's in the back there being congratulated by Ozzy with the technical stuff. So we're going to have, we have food afterwards, but we have a cake that's dedicated to celebrate some of that stuff. Also tomorrow is Randy's 70th birthday. I hope you don't mind me saying 70th birthday. Yeah, so let's we'll keep it going. Anyway, so we won't continue with everybody's birthday or whatever special event may have happened. But we're just so glad you're here. We want to be a family and celebrate together. I'm excited as we dig into Revelation chapter 12. As we dig in, let's pray just one more time. Father in heaven, I think of Zephaniah 3 where it just talks about you singing over us. And I can't imagine a God who has everything can do anything and yet can't stop thinking about these specks of dust on planet earth called human beings. We fall short, we mess up, but Lord, your grace is sufficient for us. And so tonight, we want to hear from you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us and guide us. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, amen. Amen. Thank you. Revelation chapter 12, okay. And Bob, there was a reason why I asked you what church, you had to pay attention, (laughs) what church you went to in Atlanta, all right? Because here in Atlanta, in 1949, Elder M.K. who? Yeah, second Roth, claim to fame. I was too, yeah, maybe more for my dad and his generation. Elder M.K. Eckenroth, Melvin Eckenroth of the General Conference Ministerial Association. He was an evangelist, held meetings in the city auditorium, that's in Atlanta, Georgia, which brought an increase in membership to both Peachtree Street and Beverly Road Atlanta churches. So packed it out, and these meetings weren't just uh, several weeks Over a weekend, these meetings lasted a long time. In fact, in February, they were still going of 1950, toward the end of a, how long? Six-month evangelism series. I mean, we're talking about commitment here. Six-month-long evangelism series in Atlanta, Georgia. Evangelist Melvin Eckenroth experimented, remember this is 1950, with using telecasts. I wonder if we could get some attention by using this thing called the television to stimulate interest in public meetings and to share topics such as Daniel chapter 2. Wait a second, we can look at this biblical timeline and discover Jesus is coming soon. So as these meetings were going forward, this team of evangelists are sharing this message in Atlanta, Georgia to build up existing churches and that other churches would be planted so that the gospel would go Further, that people would experience Jesus for themselves, that the three angels' messages would permeate through all of Atlanta. People would experience righteousness by faith. When that's happening, please understand, back then and certainly now, uh, the same, the enemy's going to push back. Amen? He's not just going to let this just happen without pushing back, trying to, to stop it, trying to smother it. And so he did that in 1950 as well. I was at some meetings, I told you last week, called ASI, and I met a man by the name of Lanier Watson. He saw my name tag, Chris Eckenroth, and he went, Eckenroth, are you related to M.K. Eckenroth? And I was like, yeah. Um, so, like, I've heard this before from people who are usually 80 plus, you know, and lived, you know, during his day or whatever. And I said, yeah. And he said, he said I said, yeah, t- tell me, how do you know him? He's like, well, He said, in Atlanta, Georgia in 1950, my entire family was attending meetings in Atlanta, evangelistic meetings. He said, we weren't Christians, we weren't going to church anywhere, but we started going to these meetings. It caused interest in my family when my dad got into the Bible, my mom got into the Bible, they were reading Scripture to us. Evidently, they must have been in it for the hall, you know, the long hall, because they were going to these meetings, it was changing the way they were functioning at home. And he said, we were, we were listening and we were learning and we were getting excited about what was happening. And then he said, one night as we're leaving the meetings, we, we've left the auditorium, we're crossing the street, my older sister is not paying attention and she's hit by a car, run over by a car. Uh, wow. 
He said she survived, you know, the ambulance, everything, took her to the hospital, and the way he put it seems like a bit of hyperbole, but he said every bone in her body was broken. So let's just take that for tonight as a lot of bones were broken. The next morning, though, he said, early in the morning, of course, my parents spent the night with her there in the hospital. She was stabilized, going to go into surgery the next day to, you know, set bones and repair all kinds of different things. He said, but early in the morning, before the team even came in, my parents are there, and the the team from the meetings, uh, Pastor Eckenroth came and, and his team, and they came early, like 5.30 in the morning, and they prayed over my sister, he said. They anointed her with oil, according to James chapter 5. He said, okay, they did that thing, and they left. He said, by the time um, the, I'm drawing a blank, the doctor with bones puts them back together. Yes, thank you. (laughs) Orthopedic surgeon showed up. Of course, they took, she'd already had x-rays before. Took her back, x-rays, hey, here's what we're going to do, but want to get some some x right now. Came back about an hour later, and he said, I can't explain this because I can compare the x-ray from last night and today, and I can't find one broken bone. The enemy is going to try to stop the gospel. But as Andrews was even telling us, he's going to try to cause us to believe that what God says isn't going to happen. But guess what? It is. And the Bible promises in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, and this gospel will not be stopped. This gospel will go forward of the kingdom and will be preached in all the world, no matter what Satan brings against it. He will be preached in all the world as a witness to the power of the Christ, to all the nations who are stuck. Oh, that takes us to the three angels' messages. And then the end will come. Satan will not win in this battle. The gospel will go forward. Lives will be changed for eternity, even though the enemy will bring his best. We're in Revelation chapter 12, and we notice how it all began. Verse 7 says this, and war broke out where? In heaven. That seems like a bit bit of an oxymoron that there's war in heaven, maybe between your children in the living room, but not in heaven, right? Maybe in the back seat, but not in heaven. And war, that word in the Greek, you can see it there, is, is polemos, polemos. The reason I emphasize that and say that is because, well, let me just ask this, or say this, that this war in heaven most likely was not fisticuffs, hand-to-hand, swords and, and guns, pushing and shoving. Palamos, and Palamos broke out in heaven. This Greek word, this is from where we get the English word politics. That it was a war of ideas. It was a war of words between righteousness and selfishness, between holiness and evil, between God's justice and agape love and selfishness and pride. This is the war that broke out, the battle of ideas in heaven. Michael, who is Michael? Are you guys still with me? I lost you at the the bones story, didn't I? Who's Michael? That's right, it's Christ, and his angels fought with the dragon. Who was the dragon? It's the devil, it's Satan, and the devil or Satan, the dragon, and his angels fought, verse 8, but they did not prevail. The enemy will bring his best, but Christ will prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So you can see in this little picture depicting as Lucifer goes around and begins to, to plant seeds in this war. You know what? Is what God really said, is that true? Same thing that happened in Eden you know what, I'm not sure, I mean, it's just me, but is this whole thing about the, I'm just planting seeds as he talks to the other angels? Verse 4 says this in a bit of metaphor, and his tail drew a third of the stars. So it's symbolic of, of Lucifer uh, rebelling in heaven, and a third of the stars, who were the stars? The other angels, a third of the created angels of heaven and were thrown to the earth. So not only is Lucifer, not only is the dragon cast to the earth, but also a third of the angels. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives. His primary weapon is deception, twisting God's Word, causing us to doubt 
and not have faith in what he has said. Deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Notice this insight given in a book called Desire of Ages. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or the unfallen worlds. They, he, was, he was so deceiving that even when they're cast out, they're still saying, I think he, he might have something there. The arch apostate has so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebe- rebellion. God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth, but he did not do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. The Lord's authority rests upon goodness. The Lord's authority rests upon upon mercy and love. All heaven and the unfallen worlds had been witnesses to the controversy. With what intense interest did they follow the closing scenes of the conflict? Verse 10 says this, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of who? Our God and the power of who? His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Notice this further insight. Heaven viewed with grief the amazement, Christ hanging upon the cross. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. Even until this point, just saying, I mean, he may, his administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. He could no longer await the angels as they came from where? As they came from the heavenly courts and before them accused Christ's brethren of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was what? Broken. He's been cast to the earth. And so Satan and his angels, they're cast to the earth. They no longer have this access to angels as they're coming and going from the throne room to cast doubt within their minds. But here in Revelation chapter 12, even backing up for a moment in some of those scenarios, we find how he focuses on the plan of salvation. We know, because Andrew's read it, fits perfect there, as he was in the early uh, stages of the book of Genesis, where he shows up, the creation, and he looks to deceive them, and he succeeds with Eve. Adam signs up too, and we're in a broken state. We are bent towards sin, and there's nothing we can do about it. But all of a sudden, we know as this, this holy pact, as, as the Father and Son go off by themselves, and they're going to follow through on the, pra- the pact that they had made together before creation even happened. And Jesus is going to come and deploy the plan of salvation. Somebody should say amen. Notice as the plan is deployed here in Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now, a great sign appeared where? Heaven, a woman... Being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. A couple of definitions here. Number one, who is this woman? Well, it's the church. It's the followers of Christ. Who is this with child to give birth? It's the arrival of Jesus. We get the idea here that all of a sudden it's Joseph and Mary, and Mary's going to give birth. Impregnated, uh, having come, the Holy Spirit come upon her. She's going to give birth to the Messiah, to the Savior. Verse 4, and the dragon, again, who's the dragon? Satan stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. He's going to do everything he can. We see this common thread to destroy the plan of salvation, whether it's in Atlanta, Georgia in 1950, or it's in Bethlehem. He's going to do everything he can to destroy the plan of salvation, to devour the child as soon as it was born. And we know this to be true because you may remember that all of a sudden there was this edict from Rome that all the children from two years old and under were to be killed, right? 
Satan is behind the scenes. He's working through governmental powers to try to destroy the Savior. If we can just get rid of all the babies, he thought, one of them will happen to be the Christ, and I will thwart, I will get in the way of the plan of salvation. Verse 5, she bore a male child. It's a capital C because it is the Christ who was to to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and His throne. And so it's like this fast-forward verse. Well, all of a sudden, Jesus is born. It doesn't tell us, but we know that He lived His life. He grew in favor with God and man. He began His ministry at the age of 30. He lived and worked among people. He preached. He taught. He healed people. He took a little bit of food and made a lot of food. He showed up to, to funerals that were happening in the very moment. He said, hold on, can we just stop a second? And this widow went home with her child again. I mean, talk about getting in the way of Satan trying to mess it up. He stops it, puts a pause on a funeral, and says, let me just give you a taste of what's going to happen at the end. Jesus goes to the cross. He gives His life away. He dies on that cross for you and for me. He pays the penalty. has been paid in full. By the way, you have been bought at a price. Your salvation has been paid for in full. The free gift has been given. Will we receive it? Will we receive it by faith? Jesus lies in that tomb. He's there till Sunday morning. Again, you know the story where Gabriel, like a bolt of lightning, comes down, moves that stone as if it's nothing, and says, Jesus, Son of God, your Father is calling you. Jesus comes out as the resurrected Christ and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's on the earth for a few more weeks, and then, just like it says, was caught up to God and His throne. He is at the right hand of the Father as your high priest and mine. Amen? We could not have a better intercessor, this one who's willing to pay the price, the ultimate price, His life, to get you home, is at the right hand of the Father who loves you and I as well. Verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been caught or cast to the earth, he persecuted who? The church or the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings. Typically in Bible prophecy, wings will uh, de- or designate or show us great speed, being able to move, given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly where? into the wilderness, in other words, to a deserted place, almost to find shelter and refuge, to her place where she is nourished. It reminds me of Elijah going by the brook Cherith, right? Where he's given the ability to flee out of the presence of Ahab quickly, and he is there for a set time where he is nourished under God's provision. Same thing. The church flees into a deserted place to find a refuge as the dragon is trying to devour Christ's church. She's nourished for a time, times and a half a time, from the presence of, no question who that is, the serpent. So let's dig in. We got into this last week, but quickly we'll review it. There's a time, times and a half a time. What does that mean? Well, a time would represent one year. Uh, Times would be two years, and a half a time, a half a year. Add it all together. You don't have to be a mathematician. That's three and a half. But as we talked about it last week, in the Hebrew calendar, there's not 365 days, there's 360 days in their calendar. So 360 times three and a half is 1260. You said, I thought I was just coming to worship. I didn't know we were going to math tonight. You never know what you're going to get. 1260 days, I'm going to suggest to you, as we did last week, that's 1260 years. You say, why would you say that? Because in Bible prophecy, oftentimes, when there is a day, it actually represents a year. We get that from several verses, one of which being Ezekiel 4, 6. I have laid on you a day for a year. So this prophecy, again, a little bit of review, review for last week for those who weren't here, and it's very easy to forget from week to week, that this prophecy began in 538 A.D. when the Ostrogoths abandoned the siege of Rome and the bishop of Rome was released to exercise civil and religious actions resulting in a pursuit to correct who? Heretics. So over this time period, all of a sudden, there's some political things that change. The, the, the stance of the church is now given more ability and, and, and influence also in political things. And all of a sudden, 
government is being given the ability to go after people who they view as heretics. And a heretic at that point is viewed as anybody who is not following exactly what the government was saying, oftentimes what the um, civil church was even saying. They didn't want people to have Bibles. People who had Bibles, they were taken away from them. You couldn't have your own Bible. People who wanted to preach uh, Christ, people who wanted to study the Bible, people who wanted to pray together, no way. This is what they called or viewed as heretics, and these are the people that they were seeking to correct through persecution. And this time period was 538 A.D. to 1798. That's our 1260-year period, our window, where there is heavy persecution that's coming from the serpent, from the dragon, from Lucifer, from Satan. After who? After the woman, after the church, to devour her. Are you still with me? Good. Then the woman fled where? Into the wilderness. The serpent, the, the dragon, Satan is trying to devour the church, but she flees into a deserted place where she has a place prepared by God. Isn't that an awesome thought? He didn't forget his family. He didn't forget his church. He had a place just prepared for his people that they should feed her 1,260 days. For over this, this millennial mark, over this 1,200-year period, the Lord is watching. Out. Let, let me just say, over this period, there's lots of people who were persecuted and killed, imprisoned, beaten, and ultimately killed. But the Lord preserved His message. The Lord preserved His Word. The Lord was still looking out for His church. But the earth helped the woman. She fled into the wilderness, and the earth helped. How would the earth, how would creation help the church? The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. What does this mean? How does the earth help the church? I think a great example of this is found as we look to the Alps of northern Italy, the Waldenses. You can see this is a very mountainous, beautiful area. This structure here, I'm supposing it's still existent from their time. But over this time period, there in the northern Alps of Italy, there was a group of people that fled into this very mountainous region. I mean, it's, a, it's an austere place. I mean, it's beautiful and the mountains, the greenery, all this. But getting there, it's no joke. You don't just take a chariot and let's just go climb up this mountain. Let's walk up this mountain with all of this gear, this heavy metal armor. And this, this, is, this is no easy task. Notice what it says here. We have this insight from a book called The Great Controversy. Behind the lofty bulwark, bulwarks of mountains. In all ages, the refuge of the persecuted and oppressed, the Waldenses found a hiding place where the light of truth was kept burning amid the darkness of the Middle Ages. Here for how long? 1,000 years. Witnesses for the truth maintained the ancient faith. God had provided for His people a sanctuary of often grandeur, befitting the mighty truth committed to their trust. To those faithful exiles, the mountains were an emblem of the immutable righteousness of Jehovah. They pointed their children to the heights, towering above them in unchanging majesty, and spoke to them, of him whose word is as enduring as the everlasting hills. You can see as there's some people taking a tour of this, they're trying to climb up there. I mean, it's... This is why the Bible says they fled into a deserted area, into the wilderness, and the, the, the earth helped the churches it hit. How did the earth help? By providing a place created by God where those who were going to maintain the flame of truth could hide out from the pursuit of the enemy. You can see how steep, rocky this is. It says, the mountains that girded their lowly valleys were a constant witness to God's creative power and a never-failing assurance of His protecting care. Those pilgrims learned to love the silent symbols of Jehovah's presence. They thanked God that He had provided for them an asylum from the wrath and cruelty of men. They rejoiced in their freedom to worship before Him. Often when pursued by their enemies. The strength of the hills proved a sure defense. Remember, the earth is providing here. 
from many a lofty cliff, they chanted, from many a lofty cliff, they chanted the praise of God, and the armies of Rome could not silence their songs of thanksgiving. Let me just pause here to say, again, coming back to what even Andrews was saying, all of this plays out exactly as Revelation 12 said. They didn't read it and say, okay, let's just try to act out everything. They were simply just following the Lord, right? And the Lord provided, the Lord caused everything to happen exactly as He had said. Here's an, another example of people taking a tour. They have candles there. They're worshiping. They're singing there in a cave. Some of the caves, the very caves where the Waldenses for over a thousand years worshiped. They worshiped unmolested by the armies of Rome. They were there and protected by God as they kept the flame of truth, of Scripture, and of its Christ alive. They would write down Scriptures. They would sneak into the villages. They would share them as they kept the light of the gospel going forward. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. He couldn't get to her. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, King James Version says, with the remnant of her seed. Who were these people? These people were the people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I pause here again tonight to remind us some things we've talked about before, that we can't keep the commandments of God until we're given the commandments of God. We can try and say, I'm just going to do my best here, and I'm just going to do all of that now. Please understand, that's going to result in frustration. That's going to result in being worn out because we do not have the power to change ourselves. But there is a God. His name is Jesus, and He is still the Creator. The one who created in Eden is still the one who can recreate you and me. And He takes out the heart of stone and puts out a heart of flesh. And the Bible tells us that on the heart of flesh is written His commandments. And what He's written on the inside will begin to reflect itself where? On the outside. In other words, here's a group of people that the enemy is coming after who've experienced the gospel for themselves. They haven't just heard about it. They have a testimony to give about the gospel. I'm telling you, I couldn't. I'm telling you, I tried. But Jesus did for me that which I couldn't do. The commandments are now written on their hearts. They're living a life they couldn't live. They're living a life of obedience. They're living a life of commitment. It is the Lord who has worked and done this in them, and they have the testimony of Jesus. As we just studied, for 1,260 years, the enemy persecuted the church, but the Lord made provision where his church could go and find refuge, like this fortress up there in the mountains. As the enemy spewed out persecution, it says that the earth just swallowed it up, that they could keep Bible truth sustained, keep the flame going. So for over a thousand years, we see, if you're going to use the illustration of a train, we see the church goes into this tunnel where it's found, found perf, uh, not perfection, found protection from the enemy's attacks. If Jesus had a true church going into this 1260-year period, he has a true church coming out of it, I believe. Because so many people will say, you know what, there's just so many things going on in the world today. How can you really know? Is there truth out there? Is there, is there a group of people that I can come alongside and worship with and, and be real with and authentic and pray with and have them pray with me? Is there a group of people who are studying Scripture and saying, you know what, whatever this says, in God's strength, that's what I want to do. I believe that if Jesus had a true church going in, he has a true church that came out of that 1260-year period, a church then and now that uplifts Jesus. Jesus is not a side note. Jesus is not like, oh, let me just quickly incorporate the cross here. No, everything is central from the cross. It is the light shining from the cross that illuminates every other biblical truth. It uplifts Jesus as the central teaching from which everything else comes out of. It believes in the authority, not of some of Scripture, but every word of Scripture. I have to admit to you, there's some things in Scripture I don't understand. Would, would you agree with that? <laughs> not that, but there's things that you don't understand. Some things you say, you know what? If it was up to me, I wouldn't do it that way. I love what this old pastor said. You, I can't, I won't do an impersonation, but you've heard him on the radio before. This guy's like from the 50s or 60s, but he's still on today. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he says, um, 
you know, this is God's universe, and God does things his way. Now, you may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. It's his universe. He sees things that we don't see. He sees the end from the beginning and every step in between. A church then and now that believes in the authority of the Bible. In other words, things do not shift based on culture shift. The Word of God is constant. The Word of God does not change. The Word of God is where we find the baseline of truth. A church then and now that believes in keeping all ten of God's commandments. Again, it's more than just saying, all right, I'm just going to do that. Again, you've heard me say it because I, I've been guilty of it, just saying, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. How many of you tonight are just going to keep God's commandments? That does set us up for failure because we can't do that on our own. It is only through Jesus doing that in us. It is choosing, saying, Lord, I don't even have, you have to give me the faith, you're going to have to give me the strength, you're going to have to give me the power to empower this decision we're going to make, but you're going to have to do it in me, and guess what? He will do it. He does for us that which we can't do for ourselves, but a group that believes in keeping all ten, Lord, would you write all ten of your commandments on my heart so that what's on the inside will be lived on the outside. I appreciate the insight from Pastor Mark Finley. He says this, do all religions today really keep the commandments of God? Do some pay lip service to God's Ten Commandments while ignoring the specifics of those commands? The second commandment forbids bowing down to images, but many congregations bowed before icons of wood and metal and marble. The fourth commandment, perhaps the most ignored of all, calls us to remember the seventh day as God's holy Sabbath, based on Exodus chapter 20. Any calendar shows the seventh day of the week to be Saturday, not Sunday, but drive by. Uh, but drive by most churches on Saturday, you find empty parking lots. Yet one distinguishing characteristic of God's true church is obedient to his commandments, to all ten of them. That includes the fourth, instructing us to keep the seventh day holy. Most Protestant churches do agree about nine of the commandments, the difference of opinion and practice over the fourth. God's last day church strives to follow all of God's commandments. Again, I pause to say just because I... Uh, it's a soapbox that I believe in. The, the, the Sabbath doesn't save anybody. Right? No, no the, the, the law doesn't... The law can, the, all the law can do is show me to say, I'm not that. It reveals to me my... It drives me. It drives me to Jesus. And the Sabbath does the same thing. Every single week, I'm reminded that I'm going to need a creator to recreate this heart, to do what's needed. It's not me. It's this weekly gift where we pause and say, wait a second. As we look at the cross, we say, I'm not like him. Creator, you made all of this. Would you recreate me? And then give me the kind of rest that only you can give. A church now and then that has the gift of prophecy. Oh, this is the point where we roll our eyes. You've got to be kidding me. The real question is not if you believe if we have modern-day prophets and all this. The real question, I believe, at least for me, is this. Do we believe what the Bible says? If we look at Ephesians chapter 4, you can look at it a little bit later, and somebody gave somebody prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's not just for then, that's for now. Some have the gift of being prophets, some have the gift of being pastors, some teachers, some evangelists. The question is, do we believe the Bible? You say, well, that was for the early church. That was to get to, to supercharge the gospel to, to launch there. But wait a second. What about the closing moments of verse history? Again, the question for me is, do I take God at his word? Joel chapter 2, notice what it says. And it shall come to pass afterward that I, who is the I here? It is the Lord. That I will pour out my flesh, my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall do something, shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days I will pour out my spirit. What is the context of this? When is this? Notice verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. In the closing moments, as the signs of Matthew chapter 24 are coming out, you know, the, the sun uh, being dark, the moon turned to blood, all these different things, 
The gift of prophecy is given to point everyone to Jesus, to point everyone back to Scripture, to point everyone to the one thing that can help humanity. Revelation chapter 12, the dragon went to make war with the remnant, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? I'm glad you asked. Revelation 19 verse 10 says this. It says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You could say this, the testimony of Jesus is the gift of prophecy. God's last day church will have the gifts of the spirit. So we read all the different gifts of the spirit. Those the gifts will be present among God's people to the very end. Amen? Every last gift. You might say, well, no, no, that's, that's ridiculous. That's too hard. That's impossible. We're not talking about you and me. We're talking about the creator of everything. There's nothing too hard for him. Is it too hard for him to take you as an introvert and say, I've got a prophetic word for you to share? I'm not saying I know a bunch of prophets, whatever, but what I am saying, the Word of God says in the closing moments of earth's history, young and old, men and women, maidservants, manservants, are going to receive dreams and visions that are going to point to Jesus. How do I know that? The Bible says it. God's last day church will have the gifts of the Spirit, including the spirit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is one of God. It's identifying marks of his true church. It's a church then and now that practices biblical baptism. Again, we, we always, we're always making calls here for baptism. And sometimes we're a little afraid of that. Say, I, I'm not there yet. I still got, I got things I got to work out in my life. Again, please, and I don't know everything yet. I don't know everything yet. I don't know if anybody here does. Pastor Jim, do you know everything yet? Not yet. But baptism is not a graduation. Baptism is dying to self, a symbol of dying to self, a symbol of a heart's decision, coming up new in Christ. As you make a decision, Jesus empowers the decision that you would walk with him. It's a church that practices biblical baptism, has a biblical view of death, sleeping in Christ until he comes back and wakes us up just like he did, the, the widow's son, just like he did, the Lazarus, preparing for and proclaiming the soon coming of Jesus. Now, we're here tonight on a Friday night. You could be a lot of different places. We're in Revelation chapter 12. And why are we here tonight? Why is Retro Ministries here tonight? Because Jesus is coming soon. There's not much time. Again, we look at Daniel chapter 2. This message was preached in 1950 in Atlanta, Georgia. And my dad's, uh, no, my, my grandfather's cousin, Melvin Eckroth, was preaching the same thing. We're on the toes. But here we are 74 years later. And the signs of the times are like the newspaper of the world right now saying, there's not much time. Jesus is coming. And so when we hear the Spirit of God speaking to us, that is the moment to respond. That is the moment for us to say, Lord Jesus, I can't. You're going to have to do it in me. And he does. He empowers our decisions that we make in him. It is a church that's preparing for and proclaiming the soon coming of Jesus. It is a group that has personally experienced what? Experienced what? Is this the good news that's made the difference in your life? I mean, is this, is this the story of Jesus that translate into the change of position from Satan's book of death to the Lamb's book of life. Personally experience the gospel. I can say from experience, Jesus is the Lord, not our, but my. My righteousness. Because I've had an experience with him. We go to a lot of meetings. Many of you may be churchgoers and you grew up in church. Maybe you're checking it out again for another time. And it's one thing to have all the information. But it's another thing to say, I'm telling you, it's not just information. I'm telling you, I couldn't, but Jesus changed my life. I'm telling you, the enemy spewed out all the stuff. He was trying to, to, to prevent Jesus from getting to my life, but he just kept calling. He just, he's so tenacious. He came after me. I'm telling you, you don't want to know where I was. But Jesus showed up there, and I finally just said yes, and I'm telling you, he did something for me. He's not just the Lord our, just plural, just over there, just abstract. I'm telling you, 
He's my, I've experienced, he's the Lord, my righteousness. As we dig into this word that does not change, we dig into this word that cannot uh, fall or falter, as we dig into this word, is the word of God that is a swift witness to what we really are. You want to know what you're really like? Dig into God's word and say, wait a second. Forgive my enemies. You don't know that jerk. Right? I mean, can we get real today? Jesus is dying on a cross and says, Father, forgive them. You and I got cut off on our way here and we said, Father, could there be some fire down from heaven on that person? The word of God witnesses to who I really am apart from Christ. I am a sinner. The Bible makes it clear that I am a sinner, that I am not righteous, but the requirement of heaven is righteousness. So what's going to happen? I I can't enter without that. There's going to have to be something that happens. And there is nothing, nothing. Can you say the word nothing? There's nothing we can do to work our way to meet the requirements of God's law found in his book. But here stands Jesus calling to the sinner just as you and I are. At last, the sinner who has struck out is worn out and has run out of strength, flees to his outstretched arms. It is only here where what is needed can be found. Somebody again should say amen. Isn't that the most beautiful picture? You're worn out, you've struck out, you're down and out. But here's Jesus again, just showing up. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. There you are again. His arms are outstretched just as you and I are. And if we run to him, we find exactly what is needed in our lives. It's why Isaiah said this. He said, I will greatly rejoice. Greatly rejoice in the Lord. For he has clothed me with the garments of what? salvation. He has covered me with the robe, get this word picture, of righteousness that is all-encompassing and covers us completely. Some of us here saying, ah, not that easy, because I know the verse. Not that easy. I know what it says in Exodus chapter 34. It says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering. Yeah, that's the good stuff. Abounding in goodness and truth. Keep going. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty. You don't know what I've done. He doesn't just say, hey, it's okay. It's cool. Don't worry about it. There's stuff in my life. He doesn't just clear the guilty. The Bible even makes it clear. But does it? This is what it makes clear as we look to the cross. It is the cross of Jesus that removes guilt. It's at that moment that he or she is as if they have never sinned. Jesus covers us with his own robe of righteousness. It's not that you can produce righteousness. It's going to have to come from an outside source. It's just like that piece of popcorn. You've seen me even do this illustration. You know, how many of you like popcorn? Right? Yeah, popcorn there. You know they're very hard. Have you ever eaten a popcorn that's unpopped, so just corn. <laughs> you can break a tooth that way. And then you have to go to the dentist and see, they, and it, you know, it's, it's just a mess. But what happens is, is that inside that little kernel, there's moisture. And there's nothing that's going to change about this piece of popcorn. I mean, you can look at it, you can say, we're going to have it for dinner, have a knife there ready to cut it, but nothing's going to happen unless there's an external source, heat source, that comes into the picture. When that external heat source gets close enough to that piece of corn, all of a sudden, it begins to heat up that moisture. And that moisture begins to boil. When it gets to boiling point, all of a sudden there's an explosion because what's on the inside begins to overpower what's on the outside and there's this complete transformation. It's the same thing for us that Jesus has to be the one in our lives that causes something from the outside to begin to change what's on the inside so the external is also changed. So we're transformed into his likeness. He does not give us a robe to cover sin, but takes away our sin and then gives us his righteousness. He doesn't say, you know what, just, just stay high. Let me give you this robe, but you just stay the same. You're a new creature in Christ, a new creation. This carpenter from Nazareth can't deny he, he's always going to work and making something. This creator from Eden whose knees squished in the mud is the same creator in 2024 who will go to work in your life and my life and recreate us. He doesn't just say, you know what, just remain the same. I'm just going to just get you in. He's going to come in and fix the brokenness in our lives and restore. 
Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua. He's really religious, mind you. He's the high priest standing before the angel. That's Jesus of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And the Lord who had chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Jerusalem is, a, is, a, is, a, is referring to Jerusalem literally, but it's referring to the people of God. The Lord has chosen his people. Rebuke you. Get out of the way, Satan. This is not a brand plucked from the fire. You thought you had them. You got them in the fire. They were going through this hard time. But I have rescued them out and saved them from being devoured. Now Joshua, even though he's very religious, was clothed with what? Filthy garments. It's just a word picture of his own righteousness apart from Christ. And was standing before Jesus, the angel represented there. And he spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. No, it didn't just say cover him, right? Take it away. The Creator is recreating here. And he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. It is now Jesus covering and giving us the righteousness that was stolen in Eden. Verse 11 of Revelation 12, And they overcame him, that's the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb. Of what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. And by the word of their testimony, they've had an experience. Jesus has done something for them, and they know it. They know it wasn't them. They know it was him. And they did not love their lives unto death. Don't pass over that too quickly. These people who have overcome by the cross, these people who have their own testimony because they've had an experience with Jesus, have fallen out of love with themselves. They love Jesus more than they love their own life. What do you want? You want all of me? Take it. Because the love of Christ that compels us to stop living for ourselves and to live with everything for him. It's the love of Christ that is so compelling that he would do that. Look, just take me. Take all of me. Notice this as we just, as we conclude, we may think here, again, we started with, we will end with, how the enemy is going to do everything he can to hold back the gospel from going to the world. Notice this. Earth's total population versus church membership. Okay? How many people are there in the world? Eight billion, give or take a couple. All right? So notice here. All right? So I don't know if you can see that here. The blue is the total population. The green is the end-of-year church membership. How many of you see a green line? No, it's not just a bad slide. You can't see the green line. But let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, so it's kind of brought up there. Can you kind of see there on the right-hand side where it's brought up there a little? All right, let me zoom in one more time. Okay, so Earth's population versus total church We may look at this and say, uh, I think the enemy is going to win. It would look that way, except what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that because of what Jesus did on the cross, the gospel will go forward. The cross also tells us that whatever Jesus has said, whatever his word says, he's going to follow through on. Because if he was going to bow it on anything, it was going to be this moment. He had, the mo he had all the power to say, you know what, I'm out. I'm leaving, I'm not doing this. Look, the ones I'm dying for are making fun of me, they're ridiculing me, they're spitting at me, they're, they're cursing at me. Let them have their own choice. No. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He lays down his life, he's not taken from it, he gives his life away. Whatever he has said, he will do. And even though the odds look overwhelmingly as if Satan is winning right now, here's what the Bible says. And this gospel of the kingdom, will be preached to the entire
says 100%. He said, I need to know more. Would you come in? They sat down and began to study the Bible. They went through lessons two, three, and four that day, spent three hours. At the end of that, the mafia general said, I need to know more. He said, come back tomorrow. He came back the next day. They did lessons uh, five, six, and seven, and eight. They did four more lessons, spent three more hours. The next day, he came back on and on and on. And at the end of this, in the midst of it, the mafia general is so convicted that this is the answer to the thing that's been missing in his life. Jesus the Christ, that this is true. The Bible, what it says, is really the truth. And he said, I want to be baptized. He is baptized, gives his life to Jesus, and 20 of the people who work for him in the mafia also decide to give their lives to Jesus and become Christians as well. Not only that, what he does is he's got all kinds of businesses around. He decides to shut down uh, the gambling operations that he had over the city. He decides to shut down the brothels that he had. Any immoral or illegal business he had, he shut down immediately and opened up new stores. These stores are places that he now sold fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables. I don't know if they're organic, but they were fresh fruits and vegetables there. He's selling these. While in the store there, he had a TV there, and he had a speaker there. He's playing these DVDs. You say, well, they can't do that there. You're right. But guess what? The police wouldn't touch him because he was a mafia general. Even though he had changed, they weren't about to touch him because the, the, no way. So he could do this. Time goes on a little bit. They buy a tent or rent a tent. They put it in the center of the city. And the mafia general is going to hold meetings. Again, they can't do that. They're not going to touch the mafia general because of his past. They're afraid of him. He holds a series of meetings over weeks, not six months, but over weeks. He preaches this meeting, these meetings, and over 200 people are baptized and give their lives to Jesus. Not one, not two, but several churches are planted in a place where you cannot preach the gospel, where you cannot have a church, where you cannot do this and you cannot do this. Do you know what the gospel says to a place where you cannot? The gospel says, yes, Jesus can. And the gospel comes in, the Spirit of God does what only the Spirit of God can do, and lives are changed. This is what has happened. This is what is happening, and this is what will happen in these closing moments of earth's history, that the Spirit of God will do what only the Spirit of God can do. This gospel will not be stopped. The only way it can be stopped in my life and in yours is if I say no. You've heard me say it before, the only requirement to receive a free gift is an open hand. So I wonder tonight, if there's anything the Lord's wanting to say to you, a decision he's calling you to make, maybe turning away from something, turning to something, baptism, re making a recommitment to Jesus tonight, making a recommitment to spend daily time in Scripture, whatever it might be, if he's calling you to make that kind of decision, I would invite you to do that, to make that decision tonight. Because again, there's not much time. This is an artist's rendition. If we paused out here in the back there, can you push me one more slide there? You've probably seen it. 